Well, hey everyone, happy Thanksgiving to you. This is originally being released on Thanksgiving Sunday, and I hope you had a wonderful one. We are finishing up a little teaching series we're doing right now on the meals of Jesus. We're calling it Party On, the Enduring Power of Hospitality. And this has been a three-week series, but we've actually done four meals with Jesus going back to our series prior, in which we're just looking at how, you know, Jesus ate with the most unusual people, tax collectors and sinners. He sought the poor and the disabled. He reached out to satisfy hungry hearts, whether they were poor people or rich people like Zacchaeus. We just looked at Jesus' heart for all who are alienated from one another and from God and how he welcomes everybody to his table. We did one message on it and we're like, that's not enough. We need to do more because meals and fellowship and hospitality were so central to Jesus' mission and ministry on earth. I've quoted Scott Barchi a few times in this series who said the practice of a radically inclusive table fellowship was a central strategy in Jesus' announcement of the inbreaking kingdom of God. And well, if it was a central strategy for Jesus, we want it to be central to our strategy too, because we're Jesus' disciples. That's the whole point of discipleship, is you do what your rabbi did. And it's especially important in our time and place, in the hateful, secularized environment in which we live. Stefan Poss, a Dutch theologian and pastor, said, in a deeply secularized context... We need a Christian spirituality that is not bothered with acquiring power, but that constantly finds an occasion to throw a party. Hey, we are not going to change the world by trying to seize the levers of power, but by opening our hearts and our homes and extending radical hospitality to people in the joy of the Lord, in the joy that is part and parcel of the kingdom of God. So today, we have one more meal. And in some ways, it's the meal to end all meals because it's the Last Supper. It's the central meal, the climactic meal in the ministry of Jesus. And it's kind of the paradigmatic meal in that what this meal is about is really what all of our meals, all of our hospitality with one another and the world is all about. It's trying to bring people into this reality. So let's read about it in Luke chapter 22. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover, which they do. And then we read, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. This is the word of the Lord. We thank God for it. Now I end the reading on this ominous note. There's more to come. Uh, because Judas is here and Judas, like all of us in some respect, is stuck. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm titling this message, Saving the Stuck, because that's what communion and its symbol is really all about. Now, have you ever felt stuck? Or maybe you're in a stuck sort of a situation right now. You know, just feeling stymied in some way, just stalled out in some way. It can happen with a job. You're just stuck in a, you know, classic dead-end job. It no longer motivates you. It's just a boring sameness every day. 
Maybe you wish you could change jobs, but the opportunity is not right. Maybe you're at a place in your life and career where like changing jobs or changing careers, that's kind of out of the question. You just feel stuck. It could be a health problem, physical or maybe mental or emotional. Something has constricted your life and tamped down your hopes. You're stuck in this thing. Uh, you, you, you can hardly accept it, although somehow you need to get there. You wish you could turn it into something good. There are other people who have triumph stories. I mean, my goodness, there are people who run marathons on prosthetic legs and people who take their trauma story and turn it into something that's beautiful, inspiring for others, or they, they start a nonprofit organization to help those who've been through similar circumstances. And you're like, man, I wish one day I might be able to do that, but I can hardly even just get out of bed in the morning, let alone run a marathon. And you just feel stuck in this situation. It happens with habits and addictions, you know, but character flaws that just continue to bite us in the backside, continue to damage relationships. It's not even three steps forward and two steps back. It's three forward, three back, two forward, two back, one forward, one back until we stop even trying anymore. We're not even walking. We're just stuck in this thing. We get stuck in our spiritual lives sometimes. We just feel like we're not growing anymore. And our zeal for the Lord has dissipated and it, there's, there's no zest in our spiritual lives. Whatever it is, and we all probably have some area right now in which we're stuck, it just feels awful. And we know it's not the way it's supposed to be. We're human beings, for goodness sakes, created in God's image. We have dignity and agency. We're supposed to have dominion in life. And yet something has fixed us in place, groundhogged our days so that they're just all the same. It's just the worst. Well, you know, God's people were stuck. These 12 disciples, in some respects, were still stuck. They were stuck in a bad marriage, in a broken covenant with God. God was stuck in that too, and in some ways that's a good thing because what we can't do to free ourselves, He can. Things might have stalled out and stagnated for us. God can get them moving again, and He does. He does. He promised to do it. Remember in Jeremiah 31, there's this famous statement that God makes about the old covenant and the new. He says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, but this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. God just declares this repeatedly. I'm declaring I'm going to do something new. I'm going to unstuck this nation and myself from a bad marriage. I'm going to make a new covenant. It's going to be different because it's going to come from the inside of you. I'm going to write my law and my word on your hearts and your minds. That's going to enable you to know me and obey me because you want to, not because somehow you have to. And everything is going to change one day, God declares. And in Luke 22, Jesus declares, that day is today. I'm declaring to you a new covenant forged by my body and my blood. It's the whole point of this party and all the other fellowship meals I share with people. I want to bring people into this new reality. And we experience it as we eat as we drink, and as we do it mindfully 
as we remember. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, what are we remembering? How are we remembering? Let's think this through a bit. First, we're remembering the past. Remember the past. I mean, that's the most natural use of our memory. We recall something in the past. And that's how this meal starts out. It's a Passover meal. Passover and the ensuing Feast of Unleavened Bread was Israel's Independence Day. It took them back to their origin story in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt, groaning under their oppression, and God heard and came down to save them. He sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. And when Pharaoh refused, God began to rain down plagues on Egypt. And in Pharaoh's hardness of heart, he still wouldn't let the people go until finally God said, here comes the 10th and most terrible plague, the plague of death, death on the firstborn in every household. Now, this is bad news, not only for Egypt, but potentially for Israel as well, because when God dispenses judgment for sin, he does not show favorites. He will judge all sin. And so the Israelites are in danger as well as the Egyptians. But God, of course, makes provision for this. He says, you can have a substitute. You take a firstborn or a year old lamb without blemish. You sacrifice it and take the blood and put it on the doorposts of your house. And when I send the angel of death through the land, he will pass over your homes and you will be saved. And then Pharaoh's going to send you out and let you go. In fact, this is only the beginning of the Passover. God says, you not only kill this lamb, but then you cook it and you eat it. You eat it with bitter herbs because your time in Egypt has been bitter. And this is the last supper there. And then you eat it with unleavened bread because leaven yeast in the Bible is generally a symbol of sin. I'm calling you out of your sinful plight. I'm calling you to be my holy people. And besides, we're making this happen right now. We have no time to let this bread rise. You don't have any time to prove this bake. You just make it unleavened and eat it. In fact, when you eat it, I want you to eat it with your coat and your shoes on and your walking stick in your hand, because I'm telling you, Pharaoh's going to send you out. He's going to basically jettison you out of this country, and, and we're going to be unstuck and moving into a brand new future. This is the origin story that they're celebrating together. And this is so much the first part of not only the Passover meal, but, but the Lord's Supper. It grounds us. It reminds us of where we came from, the soil out of which we've grown, the furnace in which our identity has been forged. And it was especially powerful for Israel because as has been said, the Jewish people do not have history. They have memory. And what that means is the Jewish people don't just record events that happened in the past to their ancestors. Jewish people have a collective memory of events that happened to them. This is the Jewish concept of memory. It's collective and it's like ever presently real. It's called zikaron. It's a memory that just, it clings to you. It sticks to you. It forms your identity and informs your outlook on things. It was a memory of the past that meant something deep today. In fact, take a look at this. Exodus 13. These are instructions for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead for the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. And God means it year after year after year after year, even after that first generation and second generation dies, you do this every year and you remember the past as if it's you. 
I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This thing's going to be for you. It's, it's like a, a, a sign on your hand, a reminder on your forehead, like a tattoo on your arm, like a championship cap on your head. I once was a victim, but God brought me a victory. I once was oppressed, but now I've been set free. I once was stuck in bitter circumstances. God brought me into a land flowing with milk and honey. This is how we tell our story as the people of God. You know, uh, he, I'm chosen, not forsaken. He's for me, not against me. Hallelujah. In fact, at the Passover, they sang what were known as the Hallel Psalms. Psalm 113 through 118, the Hallelujahs for God's salvation. What he has done to change their past which changes who they are right now. Of course, Jesus here at this Passover is saying, oh, there's a new exodus in the offing right now. It's a greater exodus, not just exodus from Egypt, exodus from hell, not just exodus from slavery, exodus from sin, not just from, you know, a circumstance of oppression, but from the prospects of eternal damnation. I'm bringing you out of sin and death, and I'm bringing you not just to the promised land, I'm bringing you to heaven and a new creation. Which brings us to the present. We're not just remembering the past. In many ways, we need to remember the present. You know, this is like, you know, remember who you are. Remember what your calling is presently. The things that happened in the past that we remember so that we can live a certain way in the present. And that's what the repetition of the Lord's Supper is surely intended to do. Now, interestingly here in Luke's account of the Last Supper, he reports no instructions from Jesus about doing this uh, repeatedly. He, he doesn't even really say do this every year at Passover. It almost would sound like a one-off, like here, do this in this moment in remembrance of me. But the early church was wiser than that. They said, hey, this, this was not a one-off. This is something that's to become like maybe paradigmatic for all of our meals together. You into the early church and they celebrated the Lord's Supper minimally weekly, but in all likelihood, they actually did it every day. You know, the, the, the church in Jerusalem described in Acts chapter 2 says famously, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And scholars say, surely that's the Lord's Supper we're talking about here. Well, how, how did they do it? How often? Well, a few verses later in the same paragraph, it says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and to break bread in their homes with glad and sincere hearts. That is with exuberant, happy hearts. Glad is way too tame a word. It's exuberant. It's wild joy. It's halal. It's like with hallelujahs on their lips. Every day they were called to do this or they did do this. And it had this ongoing formative effect on them. It reminded them every day of who they are, who they're called to be, what they're called to do. And this is why I'm a big proponent of like at least weekly communion in our worship services. I would suggest to small groups when you meet, you ought to share a meal together. Because by the way, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, it's really the whole meal. It's not just the first bite of bread or the first sip of wine. It's the whole meal. You are authorized as a priesthood of believers to serve communion to one another in your homes or whenever your small group meets and let it have a formative effect on you through practice. This is how so much of our life uh, becomes like noble and free. I mean, this morning I got up, I buttoned this shirt and I tied my shoes and honestly, I don't even remember doing it. I didn't even have to think about it. I just, I just did it. I probably wasn't even looking at the buttons. You just feel them and you do it. You tie your shoes in a, in a, in a, a, a few seconds and you're on your way. You're free. But not when you're a little child or a parent trying to teach a child 
how to do buttons, how to tie shoes. Oh, it is painfully slow. You're stuck in a moment and you can't get out of it, it would seem. But you got to practice. You practice every day, maybe multiple times, until you can do with muscle memory, do by rote, a thing that you used to have to concentrate on. But now your mind is free. You can do all kinds of other things. It's like driving to grandma's house on Thanksgiving. When you were a 16-year-old driver, you were white knuckling that steering wheel, concentrating on everything. You were so stressed out. You weren't even sure you could remember the way to grandma's house because you'd never really driven there before. You were only a passenger. And you're just concentrating all the time. And it's like, don't play the radio. Don't anybody talk too much. I got to concentrate. I'm trying to drive. Not anymore, right? You put one hand on the wheel. You got music playing. You're talking to your family. You know, you think about where you're going because you know the way like the back of your hand. You're free. You're unstuck through through habituation, through practice, through muscle memory. How great would it be to see communion having that present effect on us, remembering who we are, remembering what we're called to do and be? I think that's part of the appeal in this moment. Now, I'd read earlier that ominous note that Jesus, you know, shares the bread and the cup. It says, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. And we know that's Judas. And Luke doesn't tell this part of the story, but the apostle John does. That when Jesus says, somebody's going to betray me, everybody's wondering like, who is it? Is it me? And we read in John 13 that Peter, who is seated somewhere else around this U-shaped table, uh, signals to John, who's on Jesus' right, like, ask him who it is. So it says that John leans his head back against Jesus and asks, who is it? Now, you got to remember here, we even read they were reclining at table. It was a big U-shaped table. It was low. You, you reclined on pillows. You know, you had your head and your hands in. You had your feet out. You would lean on your left elbow and eat with your right hand. John's here. He leans back. He's like, Lord, who is it? Jesus says, it's the one I dipped this morsel with. And he takes a morsel and he dips it in the gravy or the au jus and he hands it to Judas, who has to be very close to him. He almost certainly has to be on Jesus' left, which is another place of honor next to Jesus. And Kent Hughes says, this very seating arrangement bore the architecture of grace because from left to right, it was Judas, Jesus, and John. It's as if Jesus had said to Judas, I want to have a talk with you. Sit at the place of honor to my left tonight. And the offer of the dipped morsel was both a rich symbolic custom and a powerful ultimate appeal. In that culture, the act of the host taking a morsel from the table, dipping it in the common dish and offering it to another was a gesture of honor and friendship. And Jesus is saying to Jews right here, remember in the present who you are. You're still one of the apostles. You're still my friend. You don't have to go through with what you have in your heart. Except that he does. And so Jesus says, what you must do, do quickly. And Judas leaves. And Judas by not remembering in the present moment who he could have been in Christ becomes just the worst ever. Nobody names their kid Judas. They wouldn't want to have that moniker on their own family. But now a happier turn happens as well, because oddly it says right after this, verse 24 in Luke 22, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to con be considered the greatest. So typical of these disciples. Well, the kingdom's about to come. Who's going to be the greatest in it? We know somebody here is going to be the worst. Who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus says, hey, now wait a second. The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you're not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. For who's greater? 
The one who's at the table or the one who serves it? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I'm among you as one who serves. And he had already proven that in spades by washing his disciples' feet. And it seems that these other 11 remember the present, who they are, who they're called to be, because we don't read any more situations where these bickering disciples are arguing over who's greatest. It finally lands and comes home to them in a meal with Jesus. So we remember the past, our origin story. We remember the present, who we are in Christ and what we're called to be. And we remember the future. Remember the future, Jesus would say. Now that might strike as odd, remember the future, but it's actually something we all do all the time. That is, we anticipate a future We have expectations about what is to come based on what we've experienced in the past. Sometimes just a little cue happens and we know what's coming next. You know, at at my house, uh, when the garage door goes up um, and, and I'm coming home from a day at work, Generally, it's like a happy signal. And I'm so thankful to God for this because I know my wife has actually probably created it this way. I mean, when the garage door goes up, first and foremost, my puppy gets up wherever she is and comes to the garage door ready for me to come in. And she's always thrilled to see me. But also when the garage door goes up, my kids immediately hide because that's the game we play when I get home. The garage door is up. Everybody hide. Dad, first thing in the door, pets the dog, and then has to go find the kids. And it just creates a a happy moment and a happy anticipation of of, of our time together. But we're kind of remembering the future. Like every time the garage goes up, we know what we do. Of course, it could go the other way. If you grew up in an angry household, maybe with an alcoholic father, and when the garage door went up, It could be really bad news. You never knew what your dad was going to be like or what he was going to do. Garage door goes up. You just hear it. And and all of a sudden you're anticipating a future. Your expectations for what are to come are not good. Well, Jesus at this meal helps us to remember the future, to anticipate what's coming. Because he said in verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat it again, this Passover meal, until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Verse 18, he says, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And after teaching his disciples a lesson about servanthood, he says, you are those who've stood by me in my trials and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, just leading them out. Jesus, I want you to anticipate this future. This meal signals it. We're at a table right now together, and I'm telling you, this thing is going to be amplified and glorified in ways you can't even imagine. In Isaiah 25, we read a little preview of the coming banquet in the kingdom. God says on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. All death and dying, all shame and regret swallowed up and the richest of fair provided. A feast like we can hardly imagine. It is coming. And when we take communion together, we remember, we remember this future. We remember that Jesus didn't just pay the penalty for our sins. 
He bought for us by his shed blood all the blessings of the kingdom. And so we come to communion, and this might be a challenge for some of us. We're actually to come to communion joyful, ecstatic, rather than somber, and particularly humble. A writer by the name of John Mark Hicks has helped me to understand this. He wrote a great book called Come to the Table, Revisioning the Lord's Supper. And he says, you know, here's the thing we we need to understand about communion and the Lord's table. It's a table, not an altar. We often treat it like it's an altar. And, you know, when the ancient Israelites came to the altar to like offer a sacrifice for sin, it was a somber moment. You were reflecting on your sinfulness and you were laying hands on an animal about to slay it, conferring your sin on them. It was a somber moment. But then you came to a table afterward and you would actually eat a fellowship meal with God, often of part of the animal that was sacrificed. And that was to be a joyful occasion. God himself says in Deuteronomy 12, 7, there in the temple, you know, after the altar, you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. Your sin's been paid for at the altar. We're done with that. Now we're at the table and we're rejoicing in God. We're rejoicing in all his blessings. And so John Mark Hicks says, you know, what we need to do when we come to the table is like, you know, not think of it as an altar, but think of it as it really is. It's a table. Don't think of it as Good Friday. Think of it as Easter Sunday. He says at the table, we leave all our Fridays behind us and celebrate the victory of Christ on Sunday. The table transforms Friday into Sunday. It reinterprets our sufferings and losses. The church should no longer eat on Sunday as if it were Friday. But isn't that maybe the way we were socialized into the Lord's Supper, into communion? Like a really small and really somber, you know, this is the body and the blood of Jesus sacrificed for us. Look how woeful and sinful we still are. They, you know, and, and kind of kind of get really contrite in order to be worthy to eat. But really, the spirit of the meal is Jesus says, I'm offering my body and blood, you know, at this meal, like tomorrow. And after that, it's just heaven. After that, it's just anticipating the future and the kingdom that we share. And even now in the meal, it's like I'm taking care of the sacrifice. I'm going to the cross alone. I'm doing it because this, this fellowship, I want this fellowship that we're enjoying right now, except amplified and glorified a bajillion times. And so we come to the table joyfully because Christ's work really is finished. Sin really has been atoned for. This is, this is the blood of a new covenant. You know, that, that cup, there were four cups in the Passover meal. The cups at the end of the meal uh, were known either as the cup of redemption, cup three, or the cup of praise, cup four. And Jesus says, this is a new covenant. This is our marriage together. Is that a sad occasion or a happy one? No, you raise a toast. You lift it high. Philip Yancey says this, maybe someday, instead of solemnly making our way to the tables, we should dance for joy. Maybe we should sing every born again song we know. Maybe we should tell our homecoming stories and laugh like people who no longer fear death. Maybe we should ask if anyone wants seconds and hold our little cups high to toast lost sinners found and dead brothers and sisters alive. And friends, maybe we can find ways to have that spirit more and more in our communion meal whether in the gathered worship of our church, or as I said earlier, in small groups around tables that might not only, you know, give thanks for the meal like we do, but right after that, like take bread and break it and pass it around. Say, hey, 
let's just say to one another, this is the body of Christ. And then let's take our first sip of the cup together and remember the blood of Christ, the new covenant, marriage that we're in with God right now. This is a happy meal. Let's enjoy it as we invite others into the joy of the kingdom. Amen. God be with you. Thanks for checking out our online teaching. If you enjoyed this content and would like some more information about us, head over to our website at www.willowdalechapel.org or download our app. There you can stay up to date on any events, ministries, and other opportunities we have coming up at Willowdale Chapel.